We all want to live closer to nature, but can landscapes do more for our buildings and cities? Urban greenery and water are important. They improve our well-being, they make our cities more livable. But what else can blue and green systems do? Can a high-rise building, for instance, become a habitat for birds? Can a park function as a natural ecosystem? How would these goals change the way we design? And scaling up, what could this mean in a country as vast as China? Welcome to EcoGradia, where we meet experts and practitioners at the front lines of sustainable architecture and urbanism. My name is Nirmal Kishnani. I'm a sustainable design strategist, author, and educator based in Singapore. My guest today is Yu Kong Jian. Trained in Harvard, Kong Jian is the founder and principal designer of Turinscape, an award-winning landscape and urban design firm in China. As a young man, he was one of few admitted into a university in Beijing, where he read books on landscape design in English that were unavailable to most in China at the time. He soon found his way to the US where he pursued his doctorate. Upon his return to China in the late 90s, he lobbied for change and was turned away by almost everyone. Politicians came around eventually, but not before widespread damage to the country's natural systems had been done. Today, the many parks he has designed for cities across China are far more than attractive. They are transformative. He has found a singular way to embrace urbanism and simultaneously to conserve and repair nature. Kong Jian is undeniably the most prolific landscape designer in China today, and one of the most influential in Asia. If you're unfamiliar with the projects discussed or would like to know more about some of the ideas and people mentioned in this interview, go to ecogradia.com to view notes, pictures, and links that we have compiled on the episode page. This first season of Ecogradia is sponsored by the Holson Foundation for Sustainable Construction. The foundation was created in 2003 to empower a community of future makers through the transfer of ideas, knowledge, and real-world solutions – Next year, we'll see the start of a new cycle of the Holson Awards, which is the most significant prize for sustainable construction in the world today. Go to holsonfoundation.org to find out more. Kong Jen, thank you so much for being here today. Very grateful that you found the time to sit with me. I'd like to start, if you don't mind, with what you refer to as an early traumatic experience, one that has stayed with you to this day. You almost drowned as a child. Yes. So when I fell into the river, at that time, it was, uh, I was only about six, seven years old. I fell into the river, the river was swelled, it was monsoon season, so, so the river basin is all covered with flood, with, with water. But when I fell into the river bank, or the river uh, repairing plan, and the water is slow, it's not so, so uh, rigid, uh, not so speedy as as today's river, because today's river been channelized, been speed up, as the water been, as the flow is fast. Now that's totally different river. And that river, when I was a child, that river was natural river and uh, uh, full of life, the vegetations, and the so water is, uh, 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 so, so, so the speed is slow, and and I survive because of the vegetation, because of the slow current. And uh, today, that river been channelized, and the river is fast, there's no vegetation, there's no uh, uh, shrubs, no willows to that I can scrub it on, I can, 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 can be saved. It was the naturalness of the river, the slowness of the speed of the water that actually saved your life. And that same channel, if it had been engineered for speed, would have probably cost you your life. And that was very traumatic for a six-year-old, but it, it led you on a path to think about things in a different way. How did you, uh, from this very early stage, uh, gravitate, move towards the idea of landscape architecture as a profession? So in during my childhood, I actually, my family was a landlord family. So it's not a good family. It, at that time, during the Cultural Revolution, it was a bad family, it's an enemy, it's a national, it's a state enemy. So actually, I was not allowed to go to school for a long time. I was not allowed to go to school. So I become a little a boy, a boy with mingling with nat nature. I work in the commune until the China Open uh, Policy in 1978. Uh, so I was allowed to take the examination to go to high school, uh, to, to be able to start with other, other children. And luckily enough, in 1980, 
uh, I successfully and barely passed the national examination to go to the uh, college, which is a college of forestry, Beijing Forestry University in, in Beijing City. And it says there was only one program in the nation as I had called landscape gardening. And only one program in the whole nation, about 30 uh, uh, enrol enrollments, 30 positions. And I was lucky to be one of the 30 in the whole nation. And I was only one of the 600 high school students that passed the, the national examination to undergo to the college. So in the college, at that time, the college, the, the, the program is about gardening. It is all, all, almost all about the Chinese classical gardens, the rockeries, the make small gardens, the elite garden in China, the classical garden, you know, the, the pavilions, the, the rockeries, the ornamentals. So I realized I, what, what I was studying is just to make a, you know, ornamental gardening and uh, so-called uh, beautiful, but uh, only serves the uh, urban elite. And that has nothing to do what, with my own village, with the uh, with river, with the uh, with natural landscape. So I become, uh, I become suspicious of what I, what I, what I started. It's gardening. Uh, I have nothing to do with, uh, with the uh, farmland, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the rivers the, the, and the survival of the people. So then I become uh, looking into uh, a bigger, bigger uh, 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 scope. What is really, what the real landscape architecture is. So, and, uh, and I was allowed to go to this kind of fairly small library full of English books to begin to read the English literatures. And one of the literature is, of course, Design with Nature, the book uh, written by Ian McHugh. And Ian McHugh was considered to be the father of ecological planning. Did you ever meet Ian McHugh in person? I met him in 1992, 90, which is five years later. I was able to meet him in person. He was doing a studio at Harvard Graduate School of Design, and I enrolled the program. I ran into the book, which uh, first published in 1984 by uh, 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 Richard Foreman, called the Landscape Ecology. So Richard Foreman was uh, Richard Foreman is an ecologist. Uh, he also a professor at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design. He have a very, very uh, revolutionary thinking about ecology, a special thinking about landscape ecological system. Uh, and he invented a series of uh, 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 visual, visually words, some such as patch, corridors, networks, and uh, a matrix. So he described landscape totally different compared to what uh, what in what in McHugh use right? before ecology always always talk about the ecosystem about the species about uh, about the uh, uh, relationship between species and the environment but landscape ecology landscape ecology uh, shifted the conversation from a purely biological one to a spatial one Yeah. So suddenly you were able to visualize this as a tool for planning, uh, not just as a way of describing ecosystems. Yes, exactly. So in the book, I was uh, immediately being, you know, being uh, uh, surprised by his uh, the patch, the point, the lines, the, the network, to think of visual terminology. So after you came back from Harvard, um, uh, you decided to set up a firm and you called it Turinscape. So after after Harvard... I practiced two years at the SWA group. Uh, so SWA was a leading leading uh, landscape planner, the urban designer, uh, established by Sasaki and Peter Walker. During that time, in 19, uh, 1996, I was invited to go back to China to have a visit, to give a lecture, to a series of 
universities, several universities from. And during my travel from South China, from Shenzhen to Guangzhou to to uh from Shenzhen to uh to Beijing, I travel through train, and I stop by many universities to give a talk, and I saw the dramatic, the fast change of the Chinese landscape. The river being channelized, the street being widened, uh, the trees being cut, the wetland filled, uh, the old buildings, the heritage being removed. So I immediately, immediately felt, I immediately felt that China is under a dramatic change, and this change is uh, problematic. Uh, very problematic. So then I decided to go back to China to 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 make use of what I have learned at Harvard. What what I understand is it should be better uh, approach, a better design for the, the Chinese urbanization. And I was invited by uh, Beijing University or Peking University and uh, become a professor, regional planning and landscape professor at uh, Beijing University. So almost a year later. Uh, when I find that the teaching is not enough, I have to do practice to, to change the landscape by myself, to set up the examples. But the people began to ask, you know, he say, they will ask, well, what you said is good. What you said may be good, but how can you make it happen? What you talk is totally different to what, what people were practicing at that time in China. So I decided to establish uh, as a firm to do to to show people what can we do better. You're one of the few designers in the world who advocates um, a nature-based approach to the future city. And here I'm going to quote um, from an article uh, that was written for the Harvard Design Magazine in 2009. Future cities will be new garden cities, emitting low or no net carbon, productive and conservation-minded. The new garden city is a mark, not of utopia, but of an ecological civilization. It is an art of survival. So let's break this down. You say this is not utopia, this is about survival. Now, can you elaborate a little bit about this idea of survival? And and why is it an art of survival? Why not a science of survival? That, that article was about uh, 13 years ago. And today you will see more and more true that we are facing survival, particularly we are through the pandemic. You know, it's a, it is a survival problem in China, particularly in, in Shanghai, in Beijing. You can see just a, a month ago, just last two months, uh, people being locked down in a huge city, you know, 20 million people being locked down in a whole city. And they have no food, and no fresh air, no no, no, not enough, uh, of, not enough uh, uh, vegetation. I mean, not enough vegetables, not enough food, not enough drink. So it becomes, it, it is, a, it is an issue of survival. The city we are building is a, a problem. Even during the pandemic, it's more clear. And even even not talking about the pandemic, we still have the problem of survival. Last year, just last year, a year ago. Zhenzhou flooded the Chinese city of Zhenzhou, a big city, more than 10 million people. And the whole city got flooded. And and 300 people got drawn, got, got killed in on the street, under the tunnel, in the subways, and in the cars. The city is a killer of people. People get trapped in the city. So trapped in the flood, trapped in the a pandemic, and uh, you will see even trapped in other kind of disasters, like uh, like a run out of electricity in 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 Los Angeles or, or run of water in uh, Cape Town. So we are facing series of survival survival issues: the climate change, the pandemic, the drought, the flood, uh, but. So that's why it is urban planner, landscape architects, architecture are all about 
survival. We are so close to be to be killed by our by our own design, by our own city, by 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 enforcing natural disasters. Yeah. But why is it an art? Why isn't it a science of survival? The art is about the creativity of human beings. It's about the about the beauty. It's about it's about it's what it's not about the rigidly uh, uh, engineering. Or environment. It is a, the art is how can we make something uh, turns this a skill, turns a science and engineer of survival into an art. So art is part of survival, human survival issues. So when you think about uh, the 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 uh, what we have designed as an engineered city or the so so called a science based uh, river system. We almost forget that people, human, need beauty. Human need art. Human need some flexibility. Need uh, 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 something beyond rigid science or, or rigid engineering. Uh, and and the art, the art is based on human, human creativity, human nature. It, it is a part of humanity. What do you think is the pathway for realizing this future city? And how do we get there from here? Well, we, first of all, we have to understand. Uh, we have we have to understand that what we, uh, the civilization we have built up today is not sustainable. We call it industrial civilization. So uh, the, first one, the first thing we have to to do to uh, to achieve in order to approach to in order to reach so something sustainable is that we have to be suspicious. We have to question what we have done. The so infrastructure, the so way we build our city, uh, the so, so, so energy consuming uh, uh, infrastructure. We design our buildings, the way we design our city, or the way we design landscape. Those are all based on so-called uh, uh, industrial industrial knowledge, industrial civilization. Right? So we have to question that, and this, we have to, to we, we have to understand this. The problem we are facing today, as I mentioned, including flood, in drought, uh, including the pandemic, are uh, actually at least they are the byproducts of this we call the civilization. So that's first. We we have to philosophically we have to change our mindset. So industrial civilization is is you know blessing uh, 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 give us success. What we describe success today for humanity for human being improve uh, improve so much for the society for our health or uh, uh, did give us a benefit. But at the same time, the so industrial civilization. Uh, the, the industrial civilization have this, all these byproducts by using too much energy, by depleting uh, the, the nature, by by destroying the resiliency of nature, by replacing the, the nature's uh, ecosystem with uh, gray, uh, 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 unsustainable uh, uh, energy consumption, and uh, uh, so so based based on the the uh, exploration of natural assets or natural or eco- ecosystems assets or ecological assets, uh, which is certainly uh, uh, limited, which certainly human beings have depend on. So that's one one thing we have to do. And uh, right now we have to understand that. As uh, so a second, is that what so what what is the other way to to, to replace to as an alternative or as a a complement as a support. For this, uh, the civilization we have today is ecological civilization, which is based on nature, rely on nature, uh, adapt to nature, or, or, or make wise use of nature, uh, make sustainable use of natural assets, and uh, to allow nature to provide the services. I'm not talking about to go back to the primitive agricultural civilization or agricultural era to get the free services, food, you know, adapt to water, 
or 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 beauty we we have to uh, uh, at that time it's a natural landscape. I'm talking about the designed ecosystem. We I'm talking about uh, 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 designed ecologies. So in order to achieve a sustainable urban uh, urbanism or sustainable future for our humanity, we needed to uh, based on nature, based on nature, but the creative approach. Let me let me ask you a very pragmatic question that every planner will ask you: How much of the future city needs to be natural? I mean, um, what percentage of land, for example, do you set aside for nature? You have a very wide definition of nature. Yeah, it includes parks and farms and natural areas. So, if I'm a planner, is there a method or an algorithm that I can apply to arrive at a good composition of these elements in a city? Well. Theoretically, human being can fully depend on nature's surfaces, which means every piece of the land, any individual buildings, and a city can survive without destroying the natural system. Yeah, uh, 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 determining. Depending on the scale you were talking about, it determines the facilities you can, how can you bring nature into the city? Uh, so I will say a city can depend on nature's surfaces completely if we can wisely design uh, uh, the system. So what does that mean? Net zero energy, net zero water? It, is that what you're talking about? I, Yes, I will say zero energy consumption, zero water, wastewater. Uh, now, those are possible. It is possible because we understand that human being is part of nature. Right? What we have is all, all invented. Now, can we build our building totally naturally ventilated? Of course, yeah. But certainly we will still use steel, we use concrete. Now, now the idea is that how can we we use source material, recycle source material, and make material you know, still minimum minimum cost of energy sustainable? Right now, right now I'm designing a building. Actually, try to put back the rice paddy on the roof, which means when you put a building, you didn't sacrifice any piece of land, right? So you can produce rice paddy. You can have you have rice paddy on the top. In addition. You have the green wall, so actually you 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 increase the value, the natural value, uh, by build a big green building, right? You you increase the volume of of, of uh, biomass. Uh, so that's uh, that's now that's based on today's urbanism style, and we have to think that big city is just uh, it's just two hundred years, or, or or maybe you know less than 200 years old. Urbanization is when you consider the big history of human being. The city, the city, what we understand as a city as a conglomerate, as a conglomerate human settlement, it's just one very, very short period of time. Future city will be maybe totally different. Village will be maybe another better way for a human better, higher civilization. But Gongjian, um, we are dealing with a, a, a scale of a problem that's so different from, you know, like, let's, let's compare this to the Garden City movement in the, at the start of the 20th century. Back then, we were talking about cities which had centers of 58,000 people with about 32,000 people in the satellites. But in China, in India, in many parts of the world, we're dealing with mega cities of almost 50 million people. How do you, how do you reconcile the, you know, the gray infrastructure, the high-speed rails, the, the car parks, the mobility systems of these big mega cities with some of the ideas that you're talking about? Well, as I said, because of, we know this kind of mega city has such big problems, big problems, India, China, Mexico. Uh, but as I said, this form, the, the urban form, today's urban form, is a result of humans' productive and lifestyle. The style of product, 
production now it based on big factory based on concrete big, big based on the big massive need of pro- social production uh, uh, uh people come to the city to produce to have better life uh so this is, this is one thing now is that necessary now we have to question that uh but certainly it is necessarily during the human 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 civilization human being development now we need a big city at this stage but uh, we will not need in the future i will say in the future because we have a high speed train because we have a high speed internet and because we can work and live in small town uh now that's my imagination for the future the city will be totally different from today's mega city uh and a post pandemic city will be different i think so you're talking about these polycentric configurations where small towns villages the countryside and bigger cities are kind of connected by high speed rail corridors and and so you get this kind of a marriage between the rural and the urban is that what you're talking about that is the future of the yeah. city yeah that's the future of a city now that's an upgraded version of garden city uh garden city is based on train right based on this uh, slow traffic uh, and it's been mislead by this automobile become suburbanization become a sprawl urban sprawl in what in, in america in today's uh, uh today's global urbanization uh so the garden city become garden suburb or become high high rising uh, park city or, or, or centralized uh, uh city in the park but again because of the technology development because of the high speed train and and uh, and the uh, work at home we will i will say and i tested in the past two months i live in a village actually and and it's so wonderful right i i have so many meetings i'm teaching in the, the village uh uh and uh, without a mask without the pandemic control without the lockdown i it's a miserable life here in the, in beijing in shanghai you know, look at how many people 20 million people get locked down in the city uh so I already see I already see the trend in China people began to looking for a better a better life in the small town and this has been triggered by the pandemic this kind of a uh, migration out of the city people because of uh, co- connectivity internet and and high speed rails you can actually live a high quality life connected to the world but far from the center of the city so this this devolution of the city you're seeing that in China today Yeah I have seen in China today and and uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately the policy the so, so decision maker didn't 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 see that didn't recognize that they are looking for such a place you say retired people particularly are looking for such kind of place to to live in uh, but the Chinese policy is still in force in force urbanization you know and so what what we understand urbanization is concentration of population now that's totally wrong i would say that totally wrong a new generation of urbanization is an urbanization of life lifestyle is urbanity of lifestyle not the space not the, the, the construction not the building not the land itself we can provide all this what human beings need at the, the villages with connections speed connections Uh, so as I think, that's the future. I'd like to pause a minute to remind listeners that you can view each project discussed here at ecogradia.com. There, you'll find notes and links that'll help you get more out of this episode, including information on Yu Kongjian and his firm Tourinscape. You will also find information on our episode sponsor, the Holcim Foundation for Sustainable Construction, 
In 2021, Kong Jian was awarded the Wholesome Awards Acknowledgement Prize for Asia Pacific. The jury citation for his Lee Yuman Waterway Park in Shenzhen describes it as an efficient and desirable green-blue network that creates a new recreational space for the city's inhabitants. It also integrates flood control and wastewater treatment systems that harness the biological processes of mangroves and wetlands. Now, this approach saves 70% of the energy typically required for wastewater treatment and delivers a new green space that enhances the value of a dense urban district. Over past cycles, the Wholesome Awards has recognized many other developments that bridge urbanism and ecology, producing solutions that generate new human and social capitals and at the same time restore natural capital. To find out more about past winners and the upcoming cycle of the Wholesome Awards, go to wholesomefoundation.org. Uh, governance plays a very big part in how cities are created and how they're involved. In fact, um, looking back at China's history and what had happened in the early phases, phases of uh, liberalization, you've said in an article that we've misunderstood what it means to be developed, that we need to develop a new system, a new vernacular to express this changing relationship between land and people. So when I went back to China in 1996 uh, and 97 and 97, so I see uh, what I saw is really a, a dramatic change of the landscape. Uh, we look for, uh, we simply, we look for America as our model. We look for European city as a model. We even look at Louis XIV as a model for development. So, so we totally destroy the vernacular landscape. It's a, a, a kind of a colonization, cultural, infrastructural, urbanism, colonization. Uh, of the ancient Chinese uh, 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 agricultural civilization. Now, that's a misunderstanding of development. So I'm calling for, I'm calling for new urbanism, or I mean new vernacular. Means we need to be all modernized. What I mean modern is a is a modern way of living. It's a is a thinking. It's a is a, a, a science. It's a, a, a social more democratic society is a more science-based understanding of the the, 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 the uh, nature and uh, and uh, mind. And so it is a modern way of living, but uh, certainly we need to uh, build a new kind of vernacular, which uh, is still about adaptation to the to the nature, adaptation to the climate, adaptation to the land, but uh, use a modern modern uh, 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 approach. There was an unexpected about turn in public policy in recent years. You know, suddenly we hear a talk uh, about an ecological age, and this is coming from very high up in uh, China, amongst Chinese policymakers. Um, is this something real, in your opinion? Yes, uh, I think if if you if the China make a contribution to the globe today, uh, the ecology. Uh, ecological campaign is is the biggest one, I would say. Uh, that's the uh, Chinese government uh, had made contribution to to save the world, to save the planet. Uh, the reason for that is we simply we simply cannot afford to do without ecology, to do without green movement. Uh, the, the crisis, the crisis. I will say we faced the crisis. We experienced the crisis of pollution, the flood, the the, the 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 damage we have made in the past thirty years or forty years. Until we recognize that we have to have, we have to recover nature. Huh? Uh, uh, from nineteen ninety eight, the huge flood in China. The Chinese government have made a policy to 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 deforest the mountain, for example, uh, to to retreat from the uh, from the the, the floodplain, uh, to uh, to uh, also uh, uh, to to build the the green energy system. These are very tangible solution the Chinese government is uh, is is doing. Yeah, use renewable energy, save uh, uh, more forestry, 
grow trees instead of cultivating the floodplain. We try to retreat from the floodplain to give back water more space. And uh, uh, Sponge City is another one to use nature to uh, to recover the natural landscape in the city. And also, uh, uh, you will see here today uh, a very restricted control of uh, of drainage of of, of sewage very sewage or water pollution and uh, and shut down close uh, polluted uh, pollution uh, polluted polluting factory in China now those are all tangible now look at my firm my firm grow from my one person now we have 400 people we are all doing green green things we remove all the concrete we recover in the, the wetland we we uh, create uh, uh, parks uh, to solve the problem of flood, and we also uh, 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 transform the whole river systems, uh, create a green system in Chinese cities. Uh, and the Chinese government even have so many policies, uh, regulations being changed, including the regulation of draw of uh, uh, Ecological baseline, which now become a, a law, a legal regulation to create uh, green lines or, or, or ecological lines to protect the heritage, uh, to to, uh, to to protect the farmland, uh, to reduce the size of the city. Now Beijing is not allowed to increase the footage of buildings. Yeah? You want to build anything in Beijing, you have to reduce. You uh, 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 reduce some building. You have to remove some of building to give way for uh, a new building. So all these are tangible, uh, ecological, ecologically based uh, uh, solutions or ecologically based uh, policies. In fact, you've been credited with a lot of these policy changes. A lot of the terms that have now become part of the, the vocabulary of policy uh, were ideas that you were lobbying for even before. Uh, so. Walk us through a few of these terms. Um, you mentioned ecological baseline. Um, there's also ecological security patterns that you've you've talked about. Actually, my thesis at uh, Harvard is called the ecological security pattern. So, it's my my uh, contribution to uh, to landscape ecological planning. Uh, as again, I mentioned, this idea is based on in McCarthy's in McCart's design with nature, the landscape ecology. And the uh, uh, cost standards is a ge- geographic information system uh, uh, analyze of landscape. So spatial analyze, the process analyze, the flood process, uh, the species biodiversity uh, protection, the visual analyze. Uh, so all these analyze become my uh, my uh, come to my thesis converge for me to be able to understand how in, in Chinese situation, when land resources, when land is limited, how can you protect the nature, protect the ecological process, use minimal land? Because anyone competes, you know, we have such a big population, we have such a, a large demand for urbanization and such a big demand for food, so how can you save nature? Minimum save, minimum land for, for, for nature and, and, and the wise use of, wise use of land for urbanization and protects a productive, productive agricultural land. And the ecological security pattern is one pattern which safeguarding the ecological process including flood, species, biodiversity. So when I'm back to China, I find this theory so important because China is facing exactly what I described. You know, we are competing, different processes are competing. So urbanization competing for the land, so agriculture competing for land, so ecological protection competing for the land. So what is the, what's the tool? Where is the boundary? Where is the line that where is the frontier? You should protect. You should safeguard your ecological process. So in 2000, in after a couple of years of practice in China, 
uh, from 2000, from 1997 to 2003, I began to proposed to the Chinese government the ecological security pattern idea I call the negative approach, which means you define ecological security pattern first before you build anything on the ground, before urbanization takes place. So the ecological security pattern is becomes an infrastructure, is the infrastructure for urban development. And and has this been adopted uh, yes. in, in cities? So, so give me an yes. example of where this has actually uh, resulted in a different outcome. Yeah. So now this planning, this experience, I first used in, uh, I, I, I first used in Beijing, actually. And before I used in, in Beijing, I, we did this ecological security planning create an ecological infrastructure for the, for the city in 2005-2006. And in 2006, I wrote a, 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 I wrote a letter, I wrote, I wrote a report to the Prime Minister Wen Jiabao. At that time, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao is a premier. And the premier Wen Jiabao accepts his idea. He, he, he actually personally write a, write a, was on my letter to say that we have to consider this seriously. And he, he sent, he sent a notice to the minister, to the ministry of environmental protection, to the ministry of rural urban planning, and to the ministry of land, land resources at that time. It was all the minister. So I was hired by the, by the ministry of environment to do the first draft of ecological security pattern for whole China. For this idea to define the ecological baseline, the ecological security pattern become uh, come into National Congress, the 18th, 18th National Congress. It is the uh, 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 highest uh, uh, national uh, uh, agenda define the plan the ecological security pattern at a national scale. And uh, then, then it becomes regulation afterwards. Now every city, whole nation have to define ecological security line, baseline to define where should be protected. Uh, so it become a regulation. Uh, so that's a long story from academic, from my thesis, to, uh, to my test planning in Taizhou and Beijing, and to my letter to proposal to the top leadership in China, and now transform into regulation, into policy, and become a national practice. Central to the idea of nature in the city is water. And uh, the phenomenon of flood and drought. Uh, let's, take, let's take a look at one specific project um, uh, that came out of Turinscape that embraces the flood is Yang Weizhou Park. This is a, a project that's in Jinhua City in the east of China. Uh, and it's a park that is situated at the confluence of two rivers that run through the center of the city, right? And it's situated on this 26 hectare um, triangular patch of land that used to be a brownfield site. And the manifestation of the design is these elevated pedestrian bridges that connect the two sides of the city. Uh, shaped like a colorful dragon. And beneath that, the land behaves like a sponge. Tell me, what impact did this park have on the city, on the flooding that used to happen in the city? Now, because I was from this hometown, of my hometown, because of from this city, and because the top leadership, uh, he trusted me, he, he think I'm, you know, uh, I was uh, I was quite respected in my own hometown. So he trusted me to remove the concrete flood wall uh, to return uh, this piece of land to the nature. Uh, first immediate impact was people say become a, 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 a place, a resilient place, they become a park. Uh, used to be very dangerous, as I mentioned. If you're falling into the river, you will not get back because it's a concrete, the slippery flood wall. 
Now people get a green riverbank, a terraced riverbank. Uh, and certainly this park can accumulate, can solve about a million square, a million cubic meter of water during the flood. So it's virtually reduces the risk of flood. And uh, a research by my student uh, uh, says that if we remove all the concrete wall like those, the whole river transform back to the nature. We can virtually cut, we can, we can virtually reduce 60%, 65% of the peak flow. So that's, that's a, a immediate, immediate and uh, 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 projection for this project. In addition to, uh, to that, we have, we have created a beautiful uh, public space for the people. Uh, 40,000 people use it every day and connect the city by building this bridge and also protect a, a habitat for birds, for biodiversity. Uh, and, 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 more, and beyond that, this example become a benchmark for other cities. We get visitors from, from many cities, hundreds of Chinese cities, visitors uh, the park, mayors, hundreds of mayors, visitors the park, and they take this as an example. And actually, why I know that? Because, because they always refer to see, you know, they always refer to this park to say, oh, you, we want some park like that. What I think is remarkable about Yang Weizhou Park is that it operates at so many levels, right? So you've got this public space and pedestrian bridge that takes reference from culture and history. And this looks like a like a colorful dragon cutting across the landscape. And then this is overlaid on a flood system, flood control system that doubles up as a park. Now, you have a name for this. You call this layering of human and natural space transformative deep form. Now, talk us through this idea of transformative deep form. What does that mean? So we have the so transform deep form is my description of landscape architectural urbanism as art of survival. So it, it is a combination of survival and art. That's a deep form. Survival means we is based on ecology. We, we, we used to create a form as a designer, as architect, as landscape actor. We are so used to create a form called a beautiful. The designer always want to create a form, beautiful form. But the form are more than often fake. They're not sustainable. There's no ecological base. So deep form is form based on ecological process. It is a visualization of the ecology, ecologies, I would say ecologies itself. The form of ecologies means a form of ecological relationship that have form. So the form built on, the design based on ecology, ecological process or the ecological relationship is sustainable deep form, such as the ecological process of flood, the ecological process of biodiversity habitat, uh, trans, you know, so, and also certainly the, 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 the pollution cleansing, the ecological process of cleansing the water. Now that have form. So water cleansing has form. And you have to visualize it. As a designer, we want to create something beautiful. It is an art. And this art actually is the art of ecologies or art of design ecology. Uh, uh, so that's what I described as deep form. Its form just itself is a sustainable. Let's let's take a look at uh, one specific example of the Shanghai Hutan Park that is situated in the city of Shanghai uh, on the site of the 2010 World Expo on the banks of the Huangpu River. It's about 1.7 kilometers wide, up to 80 meters wide. Now the land that this park was built on is a brownfield site, which was once a steel factory and a shipyard. 
The centerpiece of this project is this linear water body, a series of ponds that cleans the water that is taken from the river. And the processes by which this cleaning takes place is phytoremediation. So it's natural. It doesn't rely on mechanical equipment. But because of the clean water and the greenery that the park has, are there other firms in China that are thinking this way? Well, I think more and more other firms, they copy it, they, 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 they inspired by that. Uh, so it's duplicating. Uh, one example, one example, uh, which uh, President Xi Jinping visited a couple of years ago is in Nanning project. They virtually, they virtually copy this project. <laughs> they, they, and, and, and they create a beautiful, uh, uh, a river, a river park. Uh, so, so it is, it is inspiring for other people. What features, what features of Shanghai Hutan Park do we see in this project? Uh, the terraces, the field tracing, the construct wetland, uh, they copied and, uh, become, uh, 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 a major feature of that project also. And uh, I know the engineer, I know the designer, and they come to me, they said, your project inspired <laughs> my design. No, that's why I, I know that uh, our pioneer project has been uh, duplicated or some some amplified, or, or uh, it is replicable. The things that you say, um have tremendous impact at the drawing board. It, uh, they change um, the relationship of consultants and stakeholders. They are actually a different kind of practice, a different way of practicing, right? So how how does that work in, in practical terms? I mean, um, uh, when you are dealing with a solution that requires either a shift from one discipline to another or a multidisciplinary approach, how how is this operationalized at the drawing board in a project? You are right. I I will say we it, it's a definition of the profession, or it is a definition of a of a new civilization. As I said, we have to change everything. We we, we have to change everything. We, <laughs> everything needed to be changed. It is it is a time of the definition of disciplines. The so industrial civilization, the European system of education already set up. We solve the problem. We have a hydrological department, we have a architectural department, we have we have a, you know, civil engineers. So all this knowledge infrastructure we build up today is based on individual problem, solves the problem individually. We don't have, we don't have an ecologically based system yet to solve the problem, the problem holistically. Whole system. That's why today's design profession uh, is at a critical time to, to, to build up a, 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 a profession to, to design the ecologies. Whether you are an architect or a landscape architect, urbanism, they are designers of ecologies. They are designers of ecological relationship, the ecological process of human ecologies. Uh, if, if you, if you're still in educational, old educational knowledge uh, classification or knowledge structures, we will not, we cannot solve today's problem. It is a revolution. Are there young designers out there like you back then who have ideas for tomorrow, who are below the official radar? Now, what do they need to do today to be heard? Well, I would say, uh, I, I should say many young generations, many young designers uh, now have these ideas. I always been asked uh, the question about, you know, uh, they are disappointment. They, they have this passion. They want to change the world. They want to, uh, they, they, they really educate. We're well educated from abroad. They come back to China and they feel they are disappointed at the situation we are facing today. They, they want to change the landscape. They want to change the urban situation. Uh, uh, a lot of young people have this, have this passion, have this knowledge, have this uh, a willingness to change the 
the, the situation today. Uh, but compared to what I, uh, what's my situation, I think uh, they, they may need more courage. Uh, I mean, many people say, they, they keep complaining, but they say, they feel, uh, many of them feel just helpless. Uh, the reason for them to feel helpless is understandable. You know? It is because uh, the timing. When I come back to China, I have a bad, I have better timing, I would say. At that time, uh, there's no registered landscape architect yet. So we, <laughs> we are the first, we are one of the first firm to define a new profession actually. Uh, which means we, we are at the time that immediately I established a firm and immediately you get a lot of work and immediately you, you can practice what you, what you want. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the situation is, is a kind of different. Yeah? To be a single person in order to fight against the existing, I <laughs> think existing intellectual system or intellectual framework, you really need a college. Uh, you you really need to be uh, to 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 su survive the the situation uh, to be able to, and 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 also you need a skill. Okay. Last question. Yeah. So apart from the things that you do through your work, yeah, apart from the things that you do through policy, through through the projects at Tourinscape, what are the few things that must happen yeah, to get us to the world that you imagine? What are the things that must happen in the bigger context? Well, certainly, as I said, uh, this, so, so we need a more open market. I think for practice, some open and more open, more, more, more inclusive social, social ecosystem. Now that's that's I'm looking for, right? Huh? More open for competition, more open for innovative idea. Now that's why the Chinese uh, young designers, uh, I think, they needed to be have more open uh, 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 market, right? Because any practice in China, the designer architects now facing problem is that we need uh, <laughs> grade one, grade two, the registered, no, and and many. Very creative architect. Uh, uh, they have difficult. They have to. They, they, they are not equally equally treated. They are not. Uh, so we we need to see open, more more inclusive social ecosystem. I think the Chinese government are looking for that. Anyone looking for that? Uh, uh, but we have a long tradition of. Uh, 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 Unequal competition uh, environment uh, uh, for private firm like my my firm is uh, is big enough to compete, but uh, but thousands of little firm simply have no chance. Uh, so that's one thing I think we need to change. Otherwise, uh, uh, we have difficult. The second thing I think we globally uh, globally. Uh, we need an intellectual revolution. For example, as I said, uh, uh, education programs. We need to break through all these boundaries. Uh, the most difficult today I'm facing is to go across the discipline, across the board, the civil engineers, the, the engineers. Uh, uh, these, these are the, the and they are safeguarded by, by credits, by, uh, by, by certificates, by, you know, by, 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 by registration. The so same is in America. Landscape architecture, architecture, planners, all these registrations, they only, they only keep the ancient, the old knowledge system. So we, we need, we need, we need to break through all this. We need to lift, shovel, 
windily shovel 是是 knowledge， 呃、uh, ，system 是 change of value。Even it's aesthetics, it's a change of practice, so practicing ethics. Yeah, so that's、uh, looking for uh, uh, global intellectual change. That's our revolution. <laughs> These are huge challenges、uh, ahead of us. Still, yeah. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is that my twenty years practice、uh, is snowballing. It's keep growing. It's、uh, it's I build many recognition from the. From the whole world,、uh, recognition, which means get encouragement, get encouragement from 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 international organization, from media's like yourself, like from from in academia. So you always get encouragement from from the from the.、Uh, so we still have a group of people looking for this kind of、uh, innovation. And also, I'm encouraged by、uh, what I have built, what I have designed, uh, uh, is welcomed by, you know, people love it. People love it. I got a huge in, uh, 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 encouragement by those high-level decision makers. Also,、uh, for from my uh, from my uh, uh, from my 20 years ago experience of through swimming. Swimming against the current. Now I'm swimming, following the current. So I think that's a great encouragement. That's great encouragement. Encouragement. So I was I pessimistic,、uh, optimistic because we have so many projects built and beautiful and loved by people and been replicated and been and、uh, and been broadcasted and I'm encouraged by. By so many awards given by the international organizations that get recognized, and I also get uh, uh, so much encouragement by by the Chinese uh, 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 public, the society, and also、uh, even decision makers. So this is all now. I'm is not depressing. I'm see that it's growing. It's it's moving up. So that's promising. Yes, it is. Things have certainly turned out well for you, from an outsider struggling to be heard to someone reshaping the conversation in China and the world at large. Thank you, Kong Jen. It's always great chatting with you. I appreciate our time together. Thank you also to our listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, subscribe to EcoGradia on any directory or listening app where you find your podcasts. You can also find all our episodes and related notes at ecogradia.com. Please follow us on social media and recommend us to friends and colleagues. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, the Holsim Foundation for Sustainable Construction. Find out more about the good work that they do at holsimfoundation.org. And remember, the seventh cycle of the Holsim Award starts next year. Look out for the details on the site of the Holsim Foundation for Sustainable Construction, holsimfoundation.org. The total prize money in the 2023 cycle is US one million. Winning also promises global recognition, the kind that can radically alter your professional profile. And finally, a big thank you to the team who worked hard to put this episode together: Ecogradius producer Maxim Flores, editorial assistants and Matthews and Amulia de la Pala, our sound technician and editor Kelvin Brown and Flogiston. Thank you guys. Until we meet next, this is Nirmal Kishnani signing off in Singapore.